little evidence that has survived suggests that humans have been drawing funny pictures for a very long time. This comical character was drawn on a cave wall in northern Africa around 4000 BC. From about 1000 BC we have this Egyptian papyrus depicting comic anthropomorphic animals. And in the volcanic ruins of 2nd century Pompeii, these caricatured faces are scratched on the walls. Crude woodcut images from medieval Europe provide the first examples of printed visual humour. And more skillful and respected Renaissance artists, such as Peter Bruegel, frequently incorporated darkly comic imagery into their engravings. And in his prints and paintings, Dutch fantasist Hieronymus Bosch used many of what would later be considered cartoon devices. Even the great Leonardo da Vinci produced some remarkably sophisticated, comically grotesque drawings. So how do we define what a cartoon is? In Italian, cartone simply referred to the cardboard used by artists such as Leonardo to sketch an image which would be the basis of the subsequent oil painting. But over the next couple of centuries its meaning evolved and it came to signify an image with some degree of intentionally comical distortion, caricature or exaggeration. It was the late 18th century when the cartoon really became established in Britain and across Europe. James Gilray was the most highly regarded political satirist of his time and his cartoons were not only wildly disrespectful to royalty, politicians and the clergy but they were far more detailed in their execution than anything that had gone before. And Gilray was in good company. Both his contemporaries Thomas Rowlandson and George Cruikshank were also enthusiastically and skillfully making fun of those in power and Cruikshank was also amongst the first to realise the potential of humorous narrative illustration with his work for the Brothers Grimm and later Charles Dickens. At the same time in continental Europe, similar political and satirical cartoons proliferated as printed media started to dominate more industrialised, literate societies. At the start of the 19th century, the French in particular were making increasing use of lithographic printing which enables subtle shading effects not possible with wood blocks. John Granville made his reputation with his satirical series Metamorphoses of the Day in 1828. This was a collection of illustrations in which characters with human bodies and animal heads were depicted. The success of this series led to Granville producing a large amount of equally sophisticated cartoons for a wide range of magazines and books. Although Gustave Doré built his reputation on his serious paintings and engravings, he effectively had a second career as a humorist and created sensitively drawn but broadly comic cartoon illustrations throughout his life. And it was a similar story with Honoré Daumier. He was another respected and respectable artist who wasn't averse to creating daring comic illustration and caricature such as this unflattering transformation of the king. Dormier even experimented with caricatures in sculpture. All three were published in Le Charivari, which was the leading satirical magazine of the time. And the quality of its editorials and cartoon illustrations would prove to be particularly influential on an international scale. In Japan, Katsushika Hokusai was also forging a very successful career as an artist and printmaker. His explorations of visual humour form a significant part of his total body of work. And even though it's unlikely he would have been aware of them, like those European pioneers, Hokusai was laying down the foundations of what subsequent illustrators would accept and exploit as the protocols of the cartoon. In this same remarkable and revolutionary time frame, Swiss school teacher Rodolf Topfer created what is now considered the first true sequential comic strip. He wrote and illustrated the story of Mr. Woodenhead in 1827 to amuse his friends and pupils. It wasn't published until 1837, but it was an immediate popular success across Europe and it was later translated and republished in the United States as The Adventures of Obadiah Oldbook. 
First published in 1841, the satirical magazine Punch was the most popular vehicle for comic illustration in Britain. It had been inspired by the success of Le Charivari and even billed itself as the London Charivari in tribute. Of the early contributors, it was primarily John Tenniel and Richard Doyle who most avidly used the principles of cartoon work in their illustrations. They were both more prepared than most to use visual humour rather than rely on the text to produce the laughter. The children's book Straw-Headed Peter by Heinrich Hoffmann was first published in Germany in 1845. Like many books of the time, this was a moralising, rather frightening collection of stories, but unusually it was decorated throughout by Hoffmann's crude but effective cartoon illustrations. And one year later, in 1846, Edward Lear published his book of nonsense, and effectively the modern cartoon was born. It was the economy of line and lack of concern over conventional anatomy which made Lear's images so revolutionary. There was also an almost total disregard for background, and Lear used only what was essential to the meaning of the text. And if you think it's just that Lear wasn't very good at drawing, here's an example of his impeccable wildlife illustration. Love him or hate him, Lear was to the cartoon what Picasso would later be to art. Twenty years later, two other books were published, which would also prove to be influential, if for different reasons. In Germany, Max and Moritz by Wilhelm Busch was published in 1865. Like Straw-Headed Peter, this was a moralising tale about the consequences of bad behaviour. But this book was overtly and intentionally comic, and the drawn style emphasised this to great effect. Most significantly, Max and Moritz heralded the later arrival of the modern comic strip in both its format and stylistic execution. And at precisely the same time in Britain, John Tenniel's illustrations for Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass and Alice in Wonderland marked an important shift in what was considered appropriate for young readers. All the cartoon techniques Tenniel had developed at Punch were featured in his images. Large heads on smaller bodies, anthropomorphic characters and exaggerated posing all contributed to the work's status as one of the most important collections of comic narrative art. Meanwhile, back in Japan, illustrator Kawanabe Kiyosai was producing illustrations which followed in the tradition of Hokusai but were somewhat more western and overt in their comic intentions this marathon farting contest being a case in point. The prints he and others produced in the middle of the 19th century were as popular, accessible and influential in Japan as Punch and Le Charivari in the West. The first popular cartoon character appeared in Britain in 1867. His name was Alice Sloper and effectively he was the Homer Simpson of his day. The antics of this drunken work shy anti-hero were originally published in Judy magazine, a short-lived rival to Punch. He was the creation of husband and wife team Charles Ross and Marie Duval, but their rather imprecise rendition never really pinned Sloper's anatomy down. Judy didn't last long, but the character proved to be unstoppable and soon had his own comic, Alice Sloper's Half Holiday. At this point, the character was taken over by W.G. Baxter, and his was easily the most visually sophisticated and popular version. Although after Baxter's death, others were subsequently given the task of bringing Sloper to life, but never with as much success or skill. And the success of Ali Sloper undoubtedly led to the birth of two new comics in 1890. Comic cuts and illustrated chips were the first to be aimed at children, and they began what would soon be a deluge of similar publications. In 1871 in America, the satirical magazine Puck was published by Joseph Kepler. And in addition to producing a large amount of exceptionally well-drawn cartoons himself, Kepler recruited other equally talented cartoonists, such as the brothers Bernard and Victor Gillum and Eugene Zimmerman. Not too long into its existence, Puck began to feature full-colour illustration and quickly became the standards others would try to emulate. In 1881, Judge magazine did just that, 
caricaturist James Wales established the rival magazine and recruited a new team, including Zimmerman and Victor Gillum, who he successfully lured away from Puck. First published in 1894 in France, Le Rire had replaced Le Charivari as the leading humorous magazine. And like its American counterparts, it featured stylish colour illustrations by leading cartoonists of the day. The far harsher and politically challenging Simplicissimus appeared in Germany in 1896. And despite its blunt aggressive editorial tone, Simplicissimus also boasted a bright and surprisingly modern graphic style. In 1898, Kaiser Wilhelm's rage at being persistently ridiculed led to censorship, financial penalties and even imprisonment for some of its contributors. And although the magazine continued to be published for quite a few years, it was only a shadow of its former self. The impact Topfer's Mr Woodenhead had made in America can't be overstated, and one of the first to pick up where Topfer had left off was Arthur Burdett Frost. In much of his output, Frost explored the possibilities of telling a comical story in a series of related panels, and with considerably greater dexterity than Topfer's relatively clumsy doodles. There were other significant figures in the development of American comics. In addition to contributing to Puck, Frederick Opper was also a pioneer of strip art, and quickly established a looser and quicker zany style, specifically for the demands of this narrative medium. His first comic characters had appeared in 1876, and his cartoons, which ranged from the childishly absurd to the knowingly political, were featured in magazines and newspapers across the States. Because he died at the age of 24, not much is known about American cartoonist Claude Eldridge Tolles, but like Hopper, he developed a gestural energetic linear style suited to multiple frames, while retaining a precise sophisticated approach in larger single images. The Yellow Kid, named for the colour of his nightshirt, was a comic strip character that first ran in 1895 and was as popular in the States as Ali Sloper was in Britain. He had been created by Richard Outcult as an incidental character in his comic strip Hogan's Alley. And Outcult is credited with establishing many of the stylistic conventions and formatting later strip artists would take for granted. Also of significance in American strip art of this period was 1897's The Cats and Jammer Kids, drawn by Rudolf Dirks. What would go on to be an exceptionally long-running series under various names was heavily based on the earlier Max and Moritz, and like many subsequent successes, was pitched to appeal to all generations. And as the 19th century draws to a close, I'm going to end this first instalment with British cartoonist Phil May. His energetic and economic line work, most of which was featured in Punch, played an important part in steering British cartoons away from the more cross-hatched, anatomically correct drawings which had become the norm. And equally importantly, he was one of the first cartoonists whose work was sought after by the fledgling advertising industry, more of which in part two of The Art of the Cartoon. <laughs>